vaccines and drugs, which is what I'm much more familiar with doing. So it's easy to talk about what a company can achieve when it's in its nascent phase. So I'm wildly enthusiastic about this. But having run a public company for so long and struggled through those very tiresome regulatory manufacturing and launch processes, I, I know it's much harder than it sounds when you start a company. But I think that as entrepreneurs, what we all have to do is find ways to make things inexpensive and to actually do them and deliver them in the areas where they're needed. So with my new company, I will be looking to Pakistan again to um, look for ways we can uh, deliver our manufacturing process absolutely on site. And I want to finish by saying um, our patents are essential to us. Thank you, Eva. Um, Jeff, uh, thank you. with a bit of a proposition that I think we have always felt that uh, since we are involved in, develop in delivering new therapies to patients, that in fact that comes with a broader set of responsibilities. And I think it's how we choose to implement and exercise those responsibilities that I think becomes an important part of this about how we, uh, how we see this. Um, if you were to take a look at our portfolio process that we actually have and in our sense of biomedical research, one thing that we actually decided that we wouldn't do is we don't do any economics associated with any of the therapeutics that we advance in the early stages. The only thing that our matrix actually shows is two dimensions. One is the level of unmet medical need, and the other dimension is scientific tractability. And what we don't want our research scientists doing is negotiating whether or not the patients that would benefit actually are going to be able to reimburse us at a level that actually makes it economically attractive. The only thing we want them to be focused on, the only point, is the fact that they have a responsibility to bring forward new therapies for which there is no medical data. And if there is no basis for reimbursement, then we will continue to work with partners and intermediaries to make sure that those therapies are actually made available to the patients that are out there. I think that one simple change alone actually changes mindsets, behaviors, et cetera, internally, and actually avoids negotiations that, quite frankly, we have often found quite meaningless anyway at this point. The second part, I think we have put together an institute which is called the Novartis Institutes for Tropical Disease, which is located in Singapore, and they are set up as a not-for-profit research entity. There, by virtue of their incorporated status, they're actually not allowed to make profit and they're actually not allowed to charge anything more than the cost it took them to advance the therapeutic itself. Um, they interestingly have full claim on all intellectual property, both that we actually develop internally across all research sites, and they actually are also a co licensor for everything that we license externally which actually means that they work with organizations such as Gates, et cetera, to assure that different therapeutics, whether it's in areas of dengue fever, malaria, tuberculosis, et cetera, they make their way through. But what it ends up being is a uh, group where some of our research scientists elect to leave other sites to go out there because they actually find that it is uh, such a personally fulfilling experience as well as just part of our obligation that we think we actually have globally. But we try to also minimize that there's no conflicts whatsoever, again, whether or not the work of anybody anywhere can make it to patients that may need that. And this entity is another mechanism of actually assuring uh, that that's a part of the approach. I think we also believe that uh, we can work the intellectual property in most cases tends to ultimately be either around the, uh, the chemical structures that kind of ultimately get defined that have to have some uniqueness and other properties or if it's a biological entity it can be in a biological target and it can be in some other characteristics of it. Uh, in general, that protects the amount, I, unlike the software industry, and I don't know what your failure rate is, but if I take for every program that we begin, something between 93 and 97% of everything that we work on fails. So part of the economic model here is to actually make sure that you can reimburse for an extraordinary amount of, of failures that it actually takes to get to the point where it's ultimately successful. And success here means that you actually have a therapy that's needed and it provides an incremental advantage over existing therapies and it's <coughs> safe, not just initially, but safe over the long term. And all of those things require a lot. I do think so around the basic molecule and the economics of that, I suspect that will probably 
hopefully remain the same way because the ability to, to share and integrate these things together gets quite complicated, quite complicated, particularly when you start taking a look at liability laws and who holds what ultimate responsibility in a case that in fact is not that for instance, in which case you and you can only take a look at how operating rooms and medical devices work for the interaction <coughs> of those both going to be around the drug discovery and clinical information identification of targets and pooling data across multiple institutions, multiple government systems, and even around some of the personalization of these therapeutics, pooling data on health systems, understanding for whom it really is a state therapy and not a state therapy, and can I actually put, discriminate these patients at the point where I'd actually like to deliver that therapy. And here I think there's an enormous amount that can be done. And you actually have a lot of therapies that may be good for 70% but not good for 30%, but oftentimes get removed from the marketplace because we can't figure out the difference between 30% and 70%. But that discrimination a lot can come through data and come from the pooling of data. And I think a lot of those will actually come together in some very good ways. I think one, that's a huge entrepreneurial area. I think two, it's an area where governments, non-governmental organizations, private sectors, et cetera, can start to pull together. And I think there's some of the software, high technology, collaborative environment that actually do have some very pretty strong analogs. And that will change our industry and that will change how we actually even begin to ultimately start to, uh, delivering the therapeutics that uh, we deliver. And I think it will be positive, very positive for, for the system and everyone else. Uh, no praise, no. So speaking of no praise, I, I don't know why you think you can sit back there. <laughs> I want you up here. I'm gonna. Everybody wants you to move forward because entrepreneurship is a is not a spectator sport. It's not a spectator sport, and that's a, it's it's about being involved and being engaged. And in fact, that's a metaphor for what I wanted to uh, to talk about uh, today. Um, first of all, I'm extremely glad to be here, and I think we have to thank uh, the organizers uh, for picking perfect weather. This is a perfect New England fall day. Some of you are probably asking yourselves <laughs> what you're doing in here. And, uh, I'll try to make it as pain painless as possible. But also, I just want you to remember this day, because three months from now it's going to be a little bit uh, different <laughs> uh, here. Tanya, thank you very much. It's really great to see the organization that you've uh, put together here, and, and I will never call security again. <laughs> but it was right at that moment. <laughs> so, now, the, the purpose, or the desired outcome of this to share with you some of the perspectives of the cooperation and collaboration that the MIT Entrepreneurship Center has had with OPEN over the last a couple of years. And Bill uh, Allat is, uh, is here. Bill uh, helped, helped me, Imran Saeed helped me write a case called The Tale of Two Networks. Are we going to hand that out of you? They're outside. Yeah. So why don't you bring, because they're going to need something to do besides listen to my boring talk. So why don't we hand, hand those, those out. And then I have some personal observations. And I'm, I just want to make it absolutely clear that these are not the official thoughts of, in, of MIT. MIT doesn't have official positions. Just like this is Ken Morse on a Saturday telling you something that he personally thinks. And none of you... Uh, I mean, anyway, none of my colleagues even know about it. And then I have to end on time because we had this terrible lunch. <laughs> um, good. good. Um, so what have we uh, done uh, together? So I guess 10 years ago, uh, we've got, I, I'm sure I left out the people, but there's Umer and there's Ifti and there's Imran. Uh, Saeed, Imran, Kidwai, who are the other people that would like to claim that they were founders of Open 10 years ago? <laughs> Stick up your hand. Who, who will plead guilty to this charge of being a founder? Okay, so I, I applaud you. I applaud you. And uh, what about it? Hmm? Are you filming this? <laughs> well, I've got to call security. Uh, they, so, so, 
The US, uh, USAID asked uh, a group of us to do a feasibility study of setting up an entrepreneurship center uh, at IBA in Karachi. Um, and by the way, I, if any of you have a chance to work for USAID, don't do it. Uh, <laughs> they don't pay well, they don't pay on time, and uh, the, it isn't the competence level that, that uh, I like to become accustomed to. But anyway, Bill and I did that, and we went over there a few times. I tried to get out of it three times. I said, well, I won't do it unless it's a, a group of Harvard and uh, Stanford and MIT guys working together, and I thought that would kill it. <laughs> and then they, they went off and got the Stanford guys and the Harvard guys, who I recommended that, you know, they were they got even. So then they said, well, but we, we can't go, but Ken and Bill would love to go. So we went a couple of times. And basically we found that IBA was brain dead. <laughs> and there was no way that an entrepreneurship center should be built. A town that we, uh, that we face and Pakistan faces, startups in Pakistan face, have to have both technology and business in the founding teams. So, so we said, this is a great idea, don't do it. Um, I think that was the first time that, uh, and after that, believe it or not, we never heard from any of them again. So, uh, but that was what we recommended. We said take a green field approach instead. Start from scratch if you're going to do an entrepreneurship center in Pakistan. Um, now, when, when was that? That was two years ago, I think. Um, so we recommended a green field approach. So then, out of that came some other ideas, like uh, uh, Hussein Dawood and his team who wanted to do a green field business school. And they share our view that it should be co-located or located near to an engineering uh, school as well, and that business plan competitions should be combined with the uh, uh, multiple schools. Um, we were, I was invited to his advisory board meeting. Um, I said that I thought we could help him meet some folks. We introduced them to, to Babson, to Harvard Business School. Uh, they visited addressing uh, MIT students on the challenges of uh, of doing a building of a billion dollar company uh, in anywhere in the world. But uh, and he was, uh, of course, the room was full. This is something that Tanya and, and uh, we know how to do, right? Uh, we so we were full, and uh, we always get a room which is a little bit smaller than the number of people who sign up, so people have to sit on the, the stairs and you know make keep keep up. Um, and we had a dinner also for uh, him and his uh, delegation, and some of you uh, were here. Um, there was a panel discussion also at, at HBS. Uh, then, uh, in you might be wondering, why does MIT Entrepreneurship Center care so much about Pakistan? Well, they're great entrepreneurs. They're great entrepreneurs. And Sarah Bird is here today. Sarah, will you uh, stand up and be recognized? You were the first. Uh, somebody's going to say, well, Sarah doesn't, doesn't exactly look Pakistani, but you know, in her in her heart, and she's, she won, uh, was a finalist in the, the business plan competition uh, for her, and click diagnostics with uh, Tanya. I'm absolutely sure you were on the founding team of click diagnostics. Would you be recognized? <laughs> And it's not enough uh, to win. I learned this uh, from Chuck Best, uh, former president of MIT. He said, it's not enough to be the best. You have to be recognized for it. And so there is a tendency from time to time for people in this room to be a little bit shy. And I'm recommending that you expunge the concept of shy from your vocabulary and from your demeanor. Celebrate those successes. And so we took Tanya on the road. Um, and, and I tricked her into it. She didn't know what was coming, okay? So I just said, come to a party at uh, Joe Malone, the fashion boutique in the Flatiron Building in New York. And she didn't know that I had the producer.
introduced her to <coughs> business news coming, uh, introduced her to uh, Pippa Bark, that's her name. And she still didn't know what was coming. And then the next morning, uh, we were on uh, Fox Business News. And I just thought it would be kind of fun for you to see. Um, Switching gears a bit, we're going to go from the markets to business startups, and it's never too early to foster that entrepreneurial spirit. Alexa sat down with two special guests who are pushing the boundaries of what the simple cell phone can do. Ken Morse, a professor at Massachusetts Institute for Technology Sloan School of Management. He is the director of yes. MIT's Entrepreneurship Center. And Tanya Erdis is a MIT grad and co-founder of Click Diagnostics. It's a startup using cell phones to provide medical care in third world countries. Good morning to the two of you. Glad to have you here. Great to be here. You know, Ken, you've worked with uh, some great businesses some great future business leaders who run corporations today. You can rattle off some names if you feel like it. Um, but tell us, how does this program work? Because I understand it works for MIT undergrads or grads, anyone participating in the school. What do you do for these kids? Well, first of all, we select into MIT people who are ambitious but don't have too much ego. Because teamwork is very important in developing breakthrough technologies. MIT's phone has 30 courses and over 30 professors of entrepreneurship. And we have 1,500 students a year taking entrepreneurship courses. They're going out into the world. And uh, it takes a while, in some cases, for the entrepreneurship. And one of those is Tanya. And basically, in a nutshell, you took what you were working on as an entrepreneurial idea, and you created a company. It's called Click Diagnostics. What exactly does it do, first of all? So just to describe the problem, there are a billion plus people just in Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh alone that currently have almost no access to healthcare. And our team came together in a class at MIT at the Media Lab. Uh, we decided we wanted to tackle this global problem. And there was really no better place to do this than MIT, the technology, the team. And we decided to use, as you mentioned, cell phone technology to do remote diagnosis for people living in villages in the third world you know, some of the countries that we mentioned, we're starting off in South Asia, and connect them with first world healthcare. So physicians and health specialists sitting pretty much anywhere in the world. You know, Ken, one of the things you do with people like Tanya, we were talking about this before, is you graduate from the program, you experience it, you get all the great morsels, but you still get to appreciate that even after school as well, to go from mentoring and training. What kind of advice do you give to people out there right now who want to start an entrepreneurial I'm not as worried about the funding as I am about getting customers. My advice to entrepreneurial teams is get the customer. And that's what we were doing last night uh, here in New York. Uh, building the MIT network with companies that like to buy from startups, uh, with venture-minded people, and helping them uh, build their teams. Um, America's source of innovation often comes from small companies. And big companies like HP, Google, Genentech, others, all of whom have MIT roots, um, definitely look to workaholic entrepreneurs and their startups for innovation. Well, I thank you guys so much. What a great thing you guys are doing. It's a great pleasure having you. We are articulate who doesn't say um, ah, uh, or like <laughs> once. Way to go. Secondly, you got to have a charge card to go buy a suit after 9 p.m., which is when she found out she was going to be on the TV the next morning. <laughs> Thirdly, uh, when you sit uh, with the announcer, pick the seat that Tanya picked with the camera looking right at you. Um, and then lastly, if you have a chance, uh, sit so the camera shoots at your part rather than the other side. I wasn't trying to look like uh, Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it happened. So, uh, but we do the media training and, uh, and we practice uh, the words that we had to say. How many times do you think you practice before you go on TV with those guys? Hundreds. Well, it wasn't time for a hundred, but it was uh, well over a dozen. And it gets better. It gets better. And this is the way, one of the ways that as, as entrepreneurs and that as open, I want to see open celebrate more its successes and its impressive footprint with 2,200.
100 members product, so it's a great, and he got in uh, investment from, from two uh, good, uh, well-respected venture uh, funds. Uh, one of them uh, called me and said, what the heck is this idea? And I said, hey, you guys, just because it's CNN is showing some film clip of a burning tire in some back street in Karachi, you know better than that. That's not significant. And I sh they said, well, actually, we, we didn't. Um, <laughs> no, no, you're smarter than that. Anyway, they did <clears throat> Good. So the, uh, the Tech Angels Network uh, was recently, uh, well, was created a year ago and became legal, I guess, uh, in the last week or so. Is that right, Farouk? Just, just to go over that, I think that was the legal Okay, you will be, you're, you're, you're operating as if you were going to be legal. <laughs> I mean, that's uh, the precise word. So the Tech Angels uh, Network, and they have an office and the got some deal flow is a pretty cool company. He made them work like crazy. And he would, uh, he was one of these seagull managers. Do you know the concept of seagull managers? They, uh, they fly in, make a lot of noise, leave stuff behind, and fly off. <laughs>
presentation uh, has no financials. It's just a demonstration of the product. So I'm going to go quickly into uh, two other things I wanted to show you what the product can do. This was YouTube, of course, uh, channels that can be made available. <laughs> And then the, the third way, of course, you can use a product like this is to, uh, to view or download and view uh, things like... I believe that with all five-minute pitches, you have 30 seconds to one minute to capture the attention of a serious business person to earn the remaining four minutes. And you did not catch me. You lost me. Um, you lost me for several reasons. First of all, I just am totally allergic to having a typo on the first page. And you have loosing. And you know, that, that just is such a metaphor for what I think of the whole media industry anyway. Um, secondly, you didn't describe the problem. I think that in the first 30 seconds you have to describe what is the problem that you are planning to solve. Okay? And you, you created, for me, more of a problem than... Because uh, you said, well, what's missing in, I, uh, what's missing in TV today? Who, who cares? Who says? There was, it's not clear uh, that at all who cares. So ask yourself this question, who cares? And then you said, this is when I felt very much like a pretzel, or being <coughs> turned into a pretzel. You said, TV is not designed for the internet, but we bring you internet on the TV. Did everybody else hear that? <laughs> well, what, what, that's, what planet is that from? <laughs> I couldn't, I, I, I couldn't get it. So, you didn't earn my uh, attention. Can any questions just in the... Not, <laughs> okay, not. <laughs> Uh, okay. All right. Uh, uh, Bilal, you want to have a question or just a quick fall through? Because we, we don't want to Can business? Is this a hobby? What is this? What is this? Are you asking a revenue? Yes. Why don't you ask that and then Sajid can respond to that? If you frame it as a question. Well, it started out as a hobby, but it's uh, soon turning into a business. I mean, I've been in the video industry for the last 16, 17 years. And this is basically, the idea is to be a, a service uh, company, so dish network, if you will, of, uh, you know, video over the internet. It would be nice for you to tell us what are we looking at. Right. Because it, it wasn't clear at all what you were trying to tell us. I didn't know if you were telling us your story. TV at home by using the, the internet as the transmission vehicle. Right. Is that the elevator pitch? So let me, uh, let me add to this train. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Any questions would be helpful. Yes. So Sajid, not, not withstanding the $500 you promised me, which I still have. <laughs> um, there was a line in there where you said, television is the new frontier for the internet. Uh, I perceive it to be the exact opposite, mm. which is that the internet is a new frontier mm. for television. Uh, so the question for you is, who is your customer? What is this person? And how much do you think they'll pay you per month to deliver the service. Yeah. Right. Uh, well, we started out by focusing on the ethnic market within U.S. And the reason for that is, is obvious because the content from faraway countries is not available as, as readily here as, as it is for U.S. content. So that's the focus today. It's, it's uh, Southeast Asia, it's mm -hmm. Middle East. Eventually there might be some services that we charge for as well. Most How much would you charge? It um, still remains to be seen. 10, you know? 10 to 20 dollars in that range. How, how do you know that that's the number? Have you done focus groups to learn willingness to pay? <laughs> uh, do you have a two-step model? Have you like monthly or per download or the the, the whole? Yeah. As Bilal said, how are you going to make money? Yeah. All of the above. I mean, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so. yeah. All right, guys. Thank you, Sajid. All right. All right. If you're ready, Zenith, if you're ready, you, you can come. Would you like to back up? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm standing here by Tanya Ajers, who apparently your name isn't very Pakistani either. Okay. But uh, I'm going to tell you a little about what we do. So I'm going to start out with some pretty stark statistics. 
So in a country such as India, and I think the situation is in Pakistan, 70% of the population does not have access to trained medical personnel. 70%. 41% of practicing quote-unquote doctors in South Asia do not have any kind of medical training whatsoever. Oops. Okay, so millions of people die each year in developing countries from diseases that are preventable in healthcare clinics anywhere in the world instantly with virtually no physical infrastructure and very limited cost. Now that is what we do. We have mobile phone technology and a back-end network that allows uh, someone in the field, like, uh, like our woman here, to click, snap, send. Click, she takes a quick interview with the patient. Snap, takes some images, and send. Sends it onto the network. Once it goes to the network, it gets routed to doctors, the appropriate specialists, etc., who give back a diagnosis or appropriate advice. Now, remote diagnosis is one thing we can do, but with this paradigm, we can do a lot more. One of the things is screening for health risks, having screeners go out into the field and get information for maternal health for instance. Early warning systems, or AIDS, TB, SARS, all these can be done with the same technology. Now, all this is done through our network, so one of the amazing things this enables is for these, all these organizations that do these kinds of uh, uh, things, it allows them to communicate efficiently. Efficiency is what this is all about. Uh, allowing doctors to respond in bulk uh, at their leisure, wherever they happen to be. We gather the data efficiently, don't waste time, and we analyze the data intelligently to route it to appropriate people, present it in the right way, make every transaction highly, highly efficient. How do you spread this model? We use micro-entrepreneurship. Someone like Aisha here, she knows her territory. She's from the village or nearby the village. She knows who needs the service. She can figure out where to bring it out. She can figure out uh, what to charge for the service. And she can start her own small business, recruiting friends of hers, people that she knows, to grow this service locally. So we don't go out there and do this. We let the market figure it out. We give them a tool so that they can make this happen. So to Aisha, mobile medicine looks like a commodity that she can buy and resell, allowing you to grow on patients to make this happen. So we've been working with hospitals like MGH uh, locally. UPenn has a dermatology cell medicine program. Um, let's see, we have uh, uh, technological partners. We have uh, mobile carriers, who I can't mention here, unfortunately, just yet. Uh, we have uh, other organizations working with us. Um, NGOs, uh, all sorts of NGOs. And we're talking with um, uh, pharmas as well, pharmaceutical companies, who want to distribute these, these drugs. They have the cheap drug, and this is a way to, to help distribute. And I'm almost done. So, at the risk of sounding a bit cheesy, this is uh, one way to sum it up. So, quick diagnostics, good for your wallet, making this cheaper, making healthcare cheap medical treatment, and good for your health, for obvious reasons. Thank you. Look, I, I think you explained the problem pretty well, so that was a good setup there. Uh, and, and it's clear that you're passionate about the topic, which is also a very good thing. I think that's a key ingredient. What I didn't understand was, um, what are you actually providing? So the, the title says, Click Diagnostics. Mm -hmm. Are you building the app that goes on the mobile phone? Or are you delivering the medical advice to the doctors? With, and who are you going to charge for this? Is this something you Okay, sure. So yes, we're building an app, we're building a back-end network, and also developing a network of doctors. We're allowing organizations to do it internally if they have their own network of doctors, but we also have our, our own network to make it easily uh, available like in this micro-entrepreneurship. Where, where do you make, where do you make money? We make the money, um, so two different models. One, if you're allowing, for instance, we're working with one organization that wants to provide it internally, they'll just pay for the service. In the micro-entrepreneurship model, uh, it, it'll take a while to explain, but basically we charge the patients. But we don't exactly charge the patients. The micro-entrepreneur charges the patient for the service. This is how this is what makes it a business. And then we charge the micro-entrepreneur for the transaction cost of, of, making the, of, of making the diagnosis. So we don't care how much the micro-entrepreneur charges. They can charge $10 for the service if people locally can afford it. We'll charge them a small fixed rate uh, to help that transaction go. So, and that can be done through the mobile system. We don't have to actually move the cash around. We don't have to get cash from a patient. We don't have to get cash from a out of nowhere. So probably there's something fairly substantial behind it. We also use, want to use the names of the sponsors. So in one of the countries that we're dealing with, we have the mobile carrier on, uh, sponsored on the service. So that also builds some uh, credibility. 
And then we hope that the reputation uh, carries it further forward. I, I'd love for a mobile carrier to diagnose my medical problem. Okay. So, <laughs> I would not love that at all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At all. Okay. Yuri, it was, it was a great presentation. I have to say that. I mean, you know, uh, I spent a lot of time in my life making slides, and this was great. Uh, you did a great job. You really caught me, you know, with your click, snap, and oh, the send. Uh, I, I, I felt like I wanted to do this. I had no idea what click and snap were doing. I have no idea what click and snap meant here, because just somehow just didn't connect with the things over there. My, you, you did a great job of saying it's a big problem and going after a multi-billion dollar challenge. You know? Come in, guys. Quick question. Let's, let's My big problem is all of this, the big problems that people sitting in villages face, the health concerns, you're going to do this all by an interview uh, taken by a person that has no medical training? Okay. So, how do you do that? That gets information. They take images, say the skin condition, or the condition itself. That information, the interview and the image, gets sent to a doctor. And the doctor, remotely, uh, a qualified doctor, looks through that information, looks through the images, can ask follow-up questions, follow-up questions if they want. Uh, but basically using that information can diagnose the condition. And this is something we're not guessing. This is an existing model uh, that's not done with these efficiencies. But that idea of just getting information and images is done today right, in telemedicine. And, and we know that. The same thing as the law said. Of that $40 billion, how much market, how much are you going to get in year one? in year two and year three, because the road to hell is paved with 1% of big markets. And the second is, I would have liked you to have discussed the quack. The shadowy figure in all this is the person who's replaced by this. And what will be his response? Right. And how inept is he today? It's a big question. I mean, it, it's a kind of political problem that you're dealing with. One thing is possibly to recruit, recruit the quack. Um, that might be way, one way to fight it. Um, it, it will be a, a very challenging problem because we don't want to offend them, we don't have, want to uh, mess up the structure in the village. But today many NGOs do go to these villages, are providing these kinds of services. So at least one thing we're doing, we're enabling them to do what they're doing now much more efficiently. And hopefully their culture can change eventually. And, and you didn't say how much people are paying the quack today. They're paying him a buck or two, right? Yeah, that's right, which is uh, about the same as we want to charge. Your elevator pitch. Um, there's an elevator pitch contest going on right now at MIT. Uh, when when this is over, uh, what, if, you're, uh, if you want to come over and, and see that, uh, Bob Metcalf uh, is going to give an inspirational talk and, and so on. So that's, I just want to say that this elevator pitching goes on all the time. Um, and you practice makes perfect. Practice makes perfect. And I think the, the judges noticed. It was very interesting. No kidding. We completely agreed on who the two winners were and the order. Uh, so we, you know, whatever is wrong with us, we came up with the same answer uh, in the, in, through... So I'll just have you guys just summarize your thoughts on this, one minute each, and then I'll like... Uh, you like uh, overall five. Overall, not, don't announce the winner, just, you know, what yeah. you were looking for, what you saw, what you did. So, first of all, uh, it takes guts to stand up in front of an audience, even a friendly audience, and I think that every one of those who pitched is, is a winner. They're a winner for coming and trying. They're connected with, a, with an audience and, and I think uh, the, that's the big thing for me is that you played the game. It matters not whether you won or lost, but uh, how you played the game. That's the first thing. Pitches and it's tough. It's really tough when you're getting grilled. But, you know, the things that I was looking was, was one, connecting with, with us and connecting with the audience. Two, you've got to be passionate. I mean, you've got to want to do this. Uh, you know, I have a few problems with people who kind of felt like, you know, I'm just doing it, I'm doing it anyway, so who the hell are you? Um, and the third thing is, it's the, you know, I was looking at it as a business. So you've got to convince me that this is a business opportunity. I want to see that it does good, but I also want to see you're going to make money for yourself, because that's the only way this can be sustainable. Uh, so that's what I was looking for, and I was very impressed that some people just had the right formula. They really had it. Good presentations. I think not much more to add uh, to the comments. The only thing I would say is don't forget the basic questions, which is who are you selling it to, how much are you going to sell it for, how are you going to make money, and so on. Uh, we sometimes get wrapped up in the technology, 
and that becomes a central piece. Uh, the world is littered with good technology, and that doesn't work. And if I could just say some nurturing thing now. Uh, the statistics over the, the 15 years or 20 years of the MIT business plan competition is that there is no statistical difference between those who won and those who were finalists in terms of what happened to the companies over the following 10 year period. I think it's something about not winning makes you pick yourself up like that hero in Chariots of Fire and say, I'll show those guys. With the name of the winner already? Absolutely. <laughs> I decided who it was going to be, so I just put it up here. But hopefully your choice is back. Right. Okay, so folks, uh, before we announce the winner, I think we should give just another very, very strong round of applause for all the Standing up there? Well, sure. Okay, yeah, why don't we have them up one last time so everybody can see them and we'll pick the winner up. Okay. So, with that, we will go very quickly to a commercial break and when we return. Alright, so unanimous as well as the, the ratings work. So I'm and very the envelope. Sorry, at the envelope, yes. The envelope. I, I, are you the envelope person? No, no, you're going to. Okay. <laughs> and the winner, the runner-up uh, for this year's, uh, the 10th anniversary of Open, the runner-up winner is, ladies and gentlemen, Click Diagnostics. Yay! very well uh, and it's clearly a big problem that needs to be solved so I think everybody here will wish you the best of luck. Uh, humanity will be better off if you see you are presenting uh, their value proposition to a lot of different stakeholders made a lot of sense. They connected with the audience just like Sarah Palin does. <laughs> Please announce the winner for this year uh, in a very strong margin is Ednet. Jim, Jim, I, I, I just want you to know that the judges feel that uh, in terms of connecting with the audience, you are the, the Sarah Palin of education. <laughs>